righty, check, check, everyone. Doing a little bit of a different episode tonight, so let me know in the comments um, how everything's sounding, everything like that. Let's drop a couple things in here. Let us know where you're tuning in from and drop in your questions and comments in below. I'm going to make sure that we're good on all the platforms. Should be streaming on my personal Facebook page, the 100 Proof uh White Tails podcast, Facebook page, and the Old Tin Cup YouTube channel, which is where we put the Hunter Proof White Tails content up. I'm just making sure that we are all good on this, making sure all the privacies are good, marked to public. That way, um, anybody can check these out, share them, etc. Um, got a lot to talk about tonight. I know we're getting a late start with it, and we'll kind of explain why. And I'm running a solo show tonight, talk about the why for that too. Um, so yeah, just double check the privacy on the hundred proof. We're perfect. We're public over there. So anyway, we should be all live across all the platforms. If you guys could let me know how the audio is here in the office, that would be great. Uh, like I said, first time trying it down here tonight. So we'll see how it goes here in the office. Um, did a little bit of reorganizing and revamping here. So we'll see how uh, how it turns out long term. I wanted to set this up for being able to do uh, virtual Zoom conversations and calls with clients and stuff like that. A little bit more professional. Um, set up a dual monitor system, which is over here off to my my left, um, for helping me lay out and design parcels. I can see the parcel over on the big screen. Have different stuff open on another screen, etc. Just helping me bring a better product to the table for my consulting clients um, and make me more efficient through the work that I'm doing with everything. So a couple comments rolling in. Paula saying, hey, hey, Paula, how you doing? Uh, was planning on trying the syrup tonight, just a little taste to see how that's going. Um, and we'll uh, we'll see how that's going. But I'm just getting back home, literally. I know, like I said, we usually try to shoot for about a seven o'clock start and I'm about 45 minutes late. That's why we say seven ish for our start for our shows. So um, thank you guys for tuning in. Appreciate it. My mom says, sounds good. Thank you for the feedback on that. Like I said, that's the only thing um, going forward because I don't run a mix board or anything like that with um, my podcast audio or anything like that. So all these are going to be you know, recorded up live and that's what you get single takes. So uh, Nick Scott tuning in says, hey, Ben, what's up, buddy? A lot of stuff, man. A lot of topics to talk about tonight. Um, some things that a lot of folks uh, maybe aren't thinking about with a piece of property that we can dive into with that um, and kind of where I've been all day and um, all the above with it. So I need one of these old Forester 1920 tonight. This is my, obviously I enjoy this bottle. This is where I'm going to tonight. I want something with a little bit of oomph. It's Valentine's Day. My wife is teaching her class at Hobart College. So um, she'll be home late and that means I can have the show tonight and be a little late for that. Got some other stuff done today in the interim. So that's what we're doing. Uh, Russ says, hey, Ben, what's up? What's the best whiskey for Valentine's Day? Tonight I'm drinking Old Forester 1920, um, Prohibition style, uh, 115 proof. Um, this is my favorite from the Whiskey Row series um, that I've had so far. The only one I haven't had is the new 1924 from Old Forester. Uh, the price tag on that one is the reason why I haven't had it. And it just hasn't been getting that good of reviews and um i don't need to buy any more whiskey right off i'm pretty set for right now so uh yeah but anyway back to what i've been doing today um worked half day at work and then i went out oops, worked a half day at work well i guess my light just died um worked a half day at work today and then went down and did a property visit on a uh new client um consulted on a family piece of theirs before historically and then got a call from a brother of that client to consult on their piece um, laid it out brand new type of setup for me a um, couple client consultants that they had reached out to I wasn't the first on their list um, and uh, they uh, reached out to me because a couple consultants didn't even get back to them and then a couple other ones um, said that there was nothing they could do for that parcel and everything like that and the parcel is going to have some challenges and everything like that and I will um, kind of briefly touch on it it's uh it's over 75 acres of straight tillable and pasture ground there's hardly a single tree on it i think we talked i think we touched maybe three trees 
that were over six foot tall today. Um, and that's it. There's not a single tree on the parcel. So we're going to be looking at some different ideas on how to convert that and still balance the cattle aspect um, of grazing some pasture lot, as well as keeping some tillable for income for that parcel. And then balancing in hunting, being a fairly new hunter or a, um, a re-returning hunter, let's say they hunted when they were younger, but then kind of got out of it for a while. But now the kids are getting into hunting. So now that they're wanting to develop that piece for hunting, whereas a few years ago, they bulldozed the whole thing off for uh, the tillable and pasture. And what they did in tow was kind of set back all that clock. So now we have to jumpstart that and look at different ways to balance that setup. So I look forward to drawing up that map. Um, I wanted to get it on a screen. I have certain guidelines I'm working with with areas that are going to turn into pasture in the next three to five years, areas where um, the, the fields aren't yielding, which is how we're going to have to blend some of that into the plan. Um, and being totally upfront and honest with that person um, throughout the whole process of today and just talking to them about how to, um, you know, what to expect from this, you know, and this isn't going to be taking everything, you know, going full on, you have to still balance the uses of that property with the hunting and then keep your goals and uh, everything realistic with the outcome on how that turns out too. I think it does have some great potential because of some of the other habitat loss in the area. Um, I don't think we'll be able to fully offset the amount of other loss of habitat that's happened in the last 12 to 14 months, let's say, in the neighborhood, but we're going to do our best to combat it and try to provide uh, more hunting opportunity on that parcel and therefore better deer and better hunting strategy relating to that, balancing the farming aspect with the hunting aspect to try to find the best balance between those two things. And I think that's going to be huge and key for that parcel. So I'm really looking forward to that challenge and I'm glad that I was able to undertake that and um, look forward to drawing that up here tomorrow down in the office. So um, got a rough draw up on my phone and the rough paper map I have, but I want to get a nice digital copy and be able to send those um, exact waypoints out the way we lay that out to that client um, to help them, help them get that laid out. So Mark Rasmussen, I'm sorry, Mark, if I ever mispronounce your name, um, I get my own name wrong from time to time. Uh, is it too early to frost seed? That's a good topic because, uh, co-host Nate, who had some other stuff going on today and tonight, and I didn't know when I was going to be back around today because of um, everything I tried to fit into this day, burning the daylight out. Um, he was actually out seeding in one of his food plots this year. Uh, he was doing a little bit of dragging for a little bit of soil manipulation on it, um, and then uh, frost seeded or kind of reseeded some clover into that stand of that field. Um, so that's what I, he was out there doing today. I think this is a good time of the year. We might be a touch early, but with the way this seasonably, I guess, warm spring has been, um, I wouldn't be afraid to frost seed right now. Typically, I'm shooting for March, um, but because we don't have snowpack where we are specifically um, in my area where we have to deal with like runoff issues or something like that, not a lot of rain in the forecast coming up. Um, I think it's a good time to be able to get out there and frost seed some of your fields and stuff, especially if you're in a little bit um warmer of an area or an area that hasn't had snowfall i know some areas downstate binghamton and kind of going down toward new york city um some of the eastern seaboard and stuff like that massachusetts connecticut some of those areas are getting some pretty good snows right now um so that might not be a good um, option if you're tuning in from out in that area but i think right now mid-february to late february going into march if you have the right conditions of that nice freeze thaw like uh, today when it got really cold this morning. I mean, I could feel it when I was walking around today, other than a couple of the wet seeps on that property that we walked in on the fields that we're going to transition into some different uh, habitat types for that client. Um, I think that it was pretty hard and firm today from the freeze. And then during the thaw for the, throughout the day, the ground was getting softer as we walked and the snow burnt off with the sun coming out. Um, that's going to let that ground you know, suck right back in. And then when it freezes, it'll expand up. And like we talked about in the last episode with Nate um, and talking about that article with him reading that into the, uh, in the New York outdoor news, talking about how that process works where the ground heaves with the freeze because of the space, just like a water bottle freezes and fills up and expands and pops the top. You can get that with the soil where it free where it freezes, expands because it takes up more space. And then once it thaws, it sucks it back in. So it opens up those areas in the soil and then lets them back in because stuff expands and then contracts. So I think now's a good time to frost seed, but like we said, frost seeding your 
um, species like your clovers is going to be way more successful than trying to frost seed something like corn or soybeans or something like that that's more apt to rot um, for a seed. So typically a, a seed like a clover is much more applicable to frost seed. Chicory works fairly well um, frost seeded in a blend as well. So that was the only thing that Nate's mix didn't have where the 100 proof spring mix does have um, just because I had a bad mice problem in my garage and my chicory seed. Apparently mice love chicory seed and don't really touch clover seed. Um, anything that was touched by mice got thrown out, um, counted as a loss or whatnot. But all my chicory I had uh, just got completely ransacked by mice. Um, area of my garage I hadn't been in for a couple weeks and it didn't take them very long to defeather the entire bag, literally. And uh, just made a, a huge mess. And unfortunately, we just uh, we threw all the chicory out. So I got to get a little bit more to um, re-blend up for the, the rest of my frost seeding I was going to do for the experimental plots. But uh, tweaked the blend a little bit for Nate for his mix today. So that's what, uh, what Nate was out doing today while I was out consulting, running around, meeting farmers, all sorts of different stuff. So a couple comments rolling in. Nick Scott comments and says, took your advice on hinge cut and the red pine and created a screening and bedding cut deer are loving it yeah that's one of the really nice things right now this time of the year and i'm glad to hear it nick um that you can really see that real time deer usage in some of these locations that you're doing this habitat manipulation to whether it's um thinning out around apple trees um dropping some limbs if you're pruning them um, or if you're dropping some of your cuttings from your habitat uh, work that you're doing whether it's a hinge cut or it's like a mix of uh, traditional felling cuts mixed in with that hinge cutting. Um, they're definitely going to utilize those tops in that cover and structure. Um, the one thing I would do is uh, go back into these areas. And this is something I don't think is talked about enough. And really making sure that you're not boxing them in. If there's an area in your cutting that you would like them to use. And for whatever reason they're using, let's just say this half of your cutting and not this half of your cutting. Try to figure out why they're not using that. Um, whether they're not bedding in it, that could just be uh, wind direction, could be sunlight, you know, different exposure rates, um, different cover and structure that the hill and topography provide, could be a bunch of different things. But if they're not even getting in there and browsing in one area of it or not, it might be that they feel too confined or boxed into that area. So don't be afraid to go back through. Um, and I do it a lot is you get perfect textbook hinge cuts, um, but it just ends up being a little bit too thick for what deer like. And you have to go back through and open those trails back up and uh, give them multiple entry and exits out of that to make them feel safe in that location. Nick said should be able to get a lot of hardwood regeneration growth in there. The red pine are very thin. I mainly took out cherry, ash, and maple with some hickory and beech. Sounds like you had a nice little mix of a diverse pocket in there of uh, timber species. So um, with putting those tops on the ground, um, through your traditional felling or hinge cutting or whatever you were doing in that location, making sure you got enough sunlight. If you're looking to keep those hinges alive, that's kind of a main takeaway with it. Um, you will definitely get some regeneration in those areas where the tops are protecting those young tree species. Um, and that was one of the cool things that I got to see um, and really show that client um, on a real-time basis today was some of the areas where he had pushed up some brush in the ditch bed where we were looking at it. And saying, man, there's, you know, he's like, there's not just a lot of growing in here. I said, well, it is said, just the deer have ate what good little stuff is here. And he's like, well, what do you mean? So we looked in some of the brush piles and there's raspberries six, seven foot, six, seven foot tall. And there's, you know, tree sap saplings coming up, ash and dogwood predominantly. It was a little bit of a wetter spot where you kind of push the tops up into. Um, and we really got to see that real life seclusion cage of that brush pile. Um, and I said, this whole ditch would be full of this right now pretty much but because of the deer density and stuff like that it's just kind of overwhelming some of this area um and letting these areas go a few years trying to keep them thick if we want to keep them thick for habitat and cover and food value or if we wanted to kind of turn that access ditch and well that ditch into an access going up through there because it's a fairly dry ditch and with rubber knee boots you should have no problem navigating it you're down below topography grade you can get in through that defile um and that's going to give a, a good access point going up through kind of the cut of that property as we kind of lay it out, lay out these different pockets and uh, kind of divide up the property again um, versus what it was when it was more little hedgerows and stuff, uh, you know, a handful of years ago. Now we're going to 
try to speed up the clock and go forward through different uh, applications and that. So, yeah, Nick, I'm really, really, really cool on that. Want to touch on Nick's other comment here. Left multiple open areas in the cut and multiple escape routes. Sounds like he did a good job layering that in to that thing and having a good plan of that design going into it, man. So I love to hear that. Love to hear that, you know, these spots were things that, you know, you talked about, we talked about on the show and kind of took some of the bits and pieces of what we're saying. And that helped you, you know, we love hearing that um, on any side of the perspective, whether it's me, Nate, one of the guests we have on the show. Um, if we're helping you guys out, we love hearing about it in the comments. So thank you. Thank you, Nick. And thank you everybody else. It's always fed in with the, with the comments and topics. We love hearing about the successes. Nate said he was hoping to find a shed or two today while he was out there, but no such luck. Oh, well. Yeah, it's, uh, we didn't find a single shed out there today um, either. There's not a whole lot of food available because of the, um, uh, the, the row crop coming off and not having a uh, seeded in uh, cover crop or whatever behind that. But, um, yeah, I mean, you could still find a spare one, but if you have a fairly light winter like we've had, um, I haven't went out and pulled cards. I'm hoping to maybe this week or this weekend, depending on how the timelines flow with everything, um, to see what we still got holding. But I got a uh, picture from a neighbor the other day or a short video is actually what it was. And um, I think he flushed like five or six bucks out that were bedded up on this little knoll. And it looked like... Um, you know, five of those six bumped, I think, believe six deer out and five of the six at least had antlers or were still holding, um, which was really cool to see. And that was, I think, I think that was a week, week and a half ago, but it can happen like that. And especially when they're grouped up like that um, and you do have a fairly tight age structure, you do get some bumped off with this late season uh, sparring and stuff like that, especially if you got bucks that aren't really common, you know, neighbors with each other or whatever you want to call it new deer coming into an area um, because there's areas in that hierarchy or whatnot that have uh, opened up on a property because deer have been taken killed hit by cars whatever it might be um, you start seeing an influx of new deer into areas a lot of times this time of the year so and then you get a little bit of that headbutting because you don't know the the new guy on the block and you got to push him around a little bit and see where you stand with him um, so this is a good time where you can find and i found side-by-side -side antlers off of different deer, um, you know, two left sides sitting within five, 10 feet of each other, you know, for an example. Um, and I would probably attribute that to a, uh, to a, a sparring session or something between two bucks, knocking, knocking them off of each other um, as they were going with it. So yeah, it's, uh, it depends. And I mean, we've had some where I've literally been out pulling cameras um, as we're doing maybe a March shed hunt, something like that. And then we pull the cameras in April if they're still kicking. And uh, we got a buck like a day or two after we walked out of that camera location and boom, there's a buck with, with both sides or one side or um, whatever. Um, had them fresh enough where they've been, you know, walking, you know, a couple days behind us and they got blood on their head and we go, oh, shoot, now we got to walk that block again or whatever. So, um, and it's, it's completely, I say it's, it's fairly random depending on the time of the year. Um, I talked about this with a, uh, a good friend of mine the other day, um, talking about the, the, lo the locale of sheds and when they shed. Um, you could have bucks on your property throughout 90% of the winter and still find 0% of the sheds just because of hitting that magical second when that antler drops. And that could be right over your property line. It could be that they're betting on yours and then feeding on the neighbors and the neighbor finds them all in the field. Or they could be feeding on yours and betting on the neighbors and you find them all in the betting. I mean, it, it's completely somewhat random when they do drop off. Obviously, testosterone levels and body conditions are going to you know, influence a lot of that. Um, but I still think some deer do drop earlier than others as a whole. So, um, yeah, luckily this time of the year, you might find a lucky shed or two out there. And I know a couple folks have been finding them, um, but I uh, just haven't been out looking yet. Uh, mostly because I think it's a little too early. Um, historically, even with, I would say, um, a normal to moderate, we'd be on a super light, I think, on this scale. But a moderate to a normal winter, um, we are we are uh, pretty much still ahead of schedule for most of the deer shedding out. And I like to be out there when probably about 75% or so are shut out. 
and uh, we still find uh, old ones every year too. So there's ones we walk past, there's ones we walk over, there's ones we walk the ground before they even drop them on the ground there. There's ones that we've found that have been toted into spots by coyotes and chewed on. So I guess you never know. Um, and that's kind of the the adult Easter egg hunt side of it that I that I really enjoy. That you don't you don't know where the shed's gonna be. We found them in in people's yards before. We found them hanging in trees before. I've actually found one in a mud puddle before, frozen with a couple of tines sticking up out of it in an old tractor rut, which was pretty cool once upon a time. Um, yeah, hanging in bushes, found hangers, um, side by side sets, single sides, little itty bitty spikers. Um, and then, yeah, the only thing I found this year so far is that that one big deadhead. Um, that one, I say big, but that one really nice deadhead's probably 130 class or so, say eight pointer, which is a really, really solid buck um, in any place in, in New York, let alone, you know, in the country. So there's Nick's comment. Um, appreciate you, buddy. Thank you, Nick. Appreciate you, man. Definitely appreciate all the support everybody gives us. Um, means means the world to us. That's why we do this, guys, is to, to help folks out. Tom comments in said, I just saw a buck on Monday morning that still had his running across the field. Yeah, it's it's very common. Um, I'm hoping to maybe be able to get out and we've been doing some uh, some more ash tree hazard removal. Some of the smaller trees that haven't really been bore hammered yet too hard. Cleaning up some invasives right now because we've had such a light winter with uh, snow removal side of it. So we've been getting out and doing some woodlot work at the college and um I'm wondering maybe we might stumble on a shed or two. I know there was a, a freak giant that I saw when I was running the mower this year. Chased a doe almost right into the side of the tractor when I was mowing. Um, and uh, supposedly they saw him uh, late December. One of the uh, campus safety guys saw him even up into December. So it, it might be banging around there. It might, who knows, it might be over in Canandaigua Lake. He might have swam across the lake. He might be down in Naples by now or who knows where. Um, or he might be, you know, got hit by a car. It's tough to say, but, uh, there was, there was a really big one running around the college this year. So, um, and we, we did find a few when I was in college there, you know, walking the woodlots and stuff like that. But, uh, with this seasonably warm winter, I would definitely be, uh, be cautious out there for ticks. I didn't pick up any on me today. Um, in the initial tick check before I got in the truck. Um, but, uh, definitely I've picked a couple off me this year. Um, my wife, had one on her in the brief one walk we did have this year uh together pulling cards and um uh that early card pull we did in february on the one property she ended up with one on her hand but that was the only one we found that day um, and that could have just been brushing the right one piece of brush going into a a wood lot you know it's tough to say right now but the ticks have definitely been been something that's been more something to contend with uh the last couple of years um which uh kind of brings me to another good point for shed season coming up uh, permethrin, treating your, uh, my brush clothes, I call them. I have a heavy duty, um, set of brush pants that I run for, uh, shed hunting. So when I'm walking through briars and stuff like that, um, they're not poking down through to my legs or poking down through my legs as bad, um, when I'm out there walking around with it. So I treat those with permethrin. My boots get sprayed down with permethrin, um, you know, that way I'm trying to limit the amount of uh, uh, ticks I might be picking up when I'm out there in the woodlot. So, oh, Nate, good comment. I'll pop this up. So teaser alert, not talking about the hat or nothing. It's on my head, but we have our proof that came in for the 100 proof knit hats, which are available just in time for this, uh, just in time for the uh last bit of winter here as i'm trying to pull this uh picture up i'll give you the little the little logo teaser um i wish i would uh would have been able to pull this up on the screen had enough time today with everything i had going on but i'll try to get it on the screen so there we go guys this is going to be the nice hatch going on the knit hats and maybe we'll put it on the uh well it's not a patch it's a stitched in uh logo but that'll be on our knit hats. Um, so we're looking for interest. We're going to put a post up on the page here in the next couple of days, trying to generate interest to try to see how many we got to uh, put together for an order, trying to make a 
um, a bulk run to make it the most economical for folks. And when we get the final pricing back, um, we will definitely let you guys know about that. So, yes, sorry, Nate, they're embroidered, not patches. Good catch. Um, kind of caught me mid thing, which brings me to step number two of this. Had to because of the had to because of the Valentine's Sip and Stroll coming up in Phelps, New York, which we uh, will be pouring at four till seven or seven thirty, I think. Um, had to get a refill on all of our stickers, so had to put in a big order for these. Nice. I went with the three inch matte finish, hundred proof logo stickers to have at the event. Um, I think we were doing like two bucks a sticker or three for five or something like that for the, the heavy duty vinyl stickers. Um, so yeah. And, um, let us know, swing by the tasting. I think we're going to be there, you know, a little bit early to set up and everything like that. I'm sure I'll be helping my wife and Amanda and all of them do a little bit of last minute, uh, setups for stuff. So yeah, come by, say hi. We'll be at the, uh, country lawyers or it's the old country lawyers which is right between smoke and tails and the uh phelps art center which is the church there on church street there in phelps um be right out behind uh and then right across from another church too which is just a regular church um but we'll be right there it's a little red building we'll have a little placard out front tasting inside um, hunter proof whitetails will be there saturday like i said four till seven i believe is the times for that so we got to be there a little early to set up but we'll be there and i think they're going to have maybe a little bit of snack stuff to have um, a food tasting station in that location as well we will be tasting three different um well, i guess yesterday i think they're all they are all bourbons we have a we have three different bourbons we're going to be tasting. We're going to be tasting uh, going up in proof. We're going to be tasting Benchmark Old Number 8, which was a favorite last year of a lot of folks. Uh, pretty easy going 80 proofer. Bottom shelfer available every day. Um, that's a good a good one. Uh, Buffalo Trace uh, distillate. So if you can't get your hands on regular Buffalo Trace, there is Old Number 8. Um, and then we have going up in proof. We have Maker's Mark. Uh, just the traditional maker's mark. Uh, like I said, just a little bit of step up of proof from that 80 proofer. And then for our high, high proof um, offering, um, we have uh, Wild Turkey 101. So uh, yeah, Buffalo Trace represented, Wild Turkey, and then maker's mark represented. So um, three good ones, I think, and three good staples. And all those were purchased uh, from k and uh, Thanks to those folks over there for always helping us out. And um, yeah, good old newer New York. That's where this uh, been talking here because you guys have been putting in so many comments and I appreciate it, but I just wanted to have a little taste of the old Forester. It's been sitting here for about 20 minutes now. Man, that's good after a long day. That is good after a long day. So. Also wanted to shout out Nate while I'm thinking about it. Um, where is, where is it? Oh, it's right here. So Nate, the other day, I had this idea that I saw for an SD card holder and Nate whipped me up one of these bad boys and we'll put a better picture up on the podcast page, but you guys won't be able to see it. But Hunter Proof Podcast, Hunter Proof Whitetails Podcast, it reminds me of that Guess Who game from when you were a kid because the way the cards kind of rock back and forth when it's not on the little um, backer drop that I made for it so it sits at an angle and not too much of an angle where the cards fall forward. But for the offseason, um, cool thing to sit on the desk when I'm out here checking on my cameras and getting them all uh, ready for season or breaking them down at the end of season. I have a nice location. I can stash my cards. They're all organized, um, different gigabyte sizes, everything like that. So um, I thought 40 slots was going to be enough, but then I forgot that um, I went out and you know bought some cameras for some folks and stuff like that for different projects I got coming up. Um, and uh, for maybe um, 
real estate listings, stuff like that, where I can throw a couple cameras on it, get some trail cam pictures on it. Because that's one of the things that I'm noticing that a lot of parcels listed right now aren't uh, utilizing trail cam photos, whether they're historical photos or real time photos, especially real time photos. Um, everybody's got that picture from 2015 or 2016, it seems like on a property. Um, but a lot of people don't maybe have what's on that property currently. And that's where I think uh, throwing a couple cameras up when you're um, creating your listing could be um, very advantageous to helping uh, market and sell that piece of property for sure. So what else have I been doing today? been running all over. Um, like I said, college, then consulting client. Um, pretty, pretty easy going. We sat down, mapped it out, talked about specific locations that we could modify into habitat of lower field yields, wet areas that they were thinking about tiling that we can now abandon the, the tiling idea because we're going to transition that into habitat. Um, I have a nice, a, a fair size allotment of land that I'm allowed to tweak a little bit, um, and take out of the tillable program, as long as it fits for different acreage requirements for changing some of the fields, um, different uh, row requirements for the spacing of the head of the um, equipment and the size of the equipment that they're using on the parcel. Um, all that got discussed and taken into account with the different year rotations and stuff like that. So again, really cool property. I've never had one that's been 100%. And I say 100 with a little asterisk, it's probably like 99, I guess, total for the acreage, but 100% basically open ground. So it's a legit blank canvas that we are starting from scratch on in a lot of cases. I'm starting to let stuff go fallow. We talked about doing some cutting plantings or plug type plantings with different tree species, especially in some of these wetter areas. Um, there's a lot of nice red or dogwood um, native in that seed bank. Not a ton of invasives like honeysuckle and buckthorn um, that, were, that were obvious on that parcel. So that's something that has a little bit of encouragement for me. I did see some of it, obviously, in just about every woodlot you will. But it's one of those things where it's not that big of a concern to me because I'm not walking into a straight field of buckthorn or a straight field of honeysuckle or something like that. So um, looking at some of the species coming up um, and then talking to the landowner about getting familiar with some of these species, because this is stuff you're going to be dealing with you know, for, for the years or the rest of your, your time owning this property is these are the species that are going to be here. The ones that are coming up out of the seed bank and the dogwoods are coming up. They're getting fairly established and the deer are browsing them once they get to about three foot tall, nice chopping height for them. Um, and they kind of trim them into bonsai trees. But if we're flooding the habitat with good cover and some of these areas, maybe make an area where they could bed in it, you know, for the day or something like that. Um, and try to transition into developing this over time. And that's what I kind of came back to again and again, is this is this is something that we're going to make benefits that first year, but this is going to need to develop um, and progress. And Mother Nature is going to have to help us out here with some timing and helping this stuff get along. Um, and that's some of the stuff that you just can't uh, snap your fingers overnight and it makes. But different applications, like we talked about utilizing, one of the things that I love is utilizing treetops or brush and pulling them out into fields and letting that keep structure immediately in that field and then allowing nice structure to come in behind that where the deer can't reach in and browse that. Uh, that's a huge key for transitioning some of these old field type uh, habitats or fallow ground field habitats, um, transitioning them over into um, more productive forb type ground. We looked at some areas that hadn't been touched in uh, just a back corner of a field or a front corner of a field, I guess it was in this, in this uh, particular example, hadn't been touched in about six, seven years. You had nice dogwood growing in there. You had goldenrod in there. It might not look the prettiest, but it was good quality habitat. And had that been deeper in the property or a section of the property where it made more sense um, for a layout kind of side of things with the design of it, um, that's what I kept telling them. I said, this is, this is what we want to see in a few years. This is the type of structure mixed in with a couple pulled in tops or brush piles, not brush piles necessarily, but some brush in there to keep some structure out in that. You're going to have deer being able to bed out in that comfortably, um, and fit deer on the property. Whereas before it was just food. So you're literally trying to hunt them on the last hour of the day 
um, because the first hour of the day, you're probably not going to be able to get out there without bumping them. So that's where we're trying to make this property develop, but develop from basically, I guess, year one, um, which I'm really looking forward to how this property progresses going forward. And um, man, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited because I've never had a scale size of this 80 acres or 75 plus acres um, to be able to, to play with from basically ground zero and then also have to mash the uh, pasture and tillable side of it into that and being able to blend that together. And that's what you have to do is it's not just one cut and dry type thing for different people and different properties. Every situation is different. Every property is different. Every condition is different. So what works and I'm suggesting for one person, yes, there's a lot of similarities and some overlap with a lot of it because a lot of it just boils back to good hunting strategy. Um, but some of the management side of things are going to change drastically from property to property, especially for priority levels. It's going to change property to property. And that makes a huge difference um, is where the priorities need to be. And that's one of my things in my pre-visit questionnaires that I really touch on um, where I was talking to this gentleman today. And he was saying, he's like, man, I didn't know how to answer that or I didn't know how to answer this. And I said, well, one of the big ones that I put on there is, is budget. And um, a lot of people might be a little you know, sheepish to say that, you know, I, I don't have a lot to spend on it or, oh, don't worry about the, the money. That's not the issue. You know, you got different ends of the spectrum with it. But the biggest thing that I put in parentheses and started doing that when everybody said um, a dollar value is I added in, I think, last year or two years ago um, into that pre-visit questionnaire is time in the budget, because that's the most valuable resource. And that's where I find most people had the challenge with is the time side of it to doing these things. So that's why getting not only a good plan in place, but being able to prioritize the types of tasks that you got to do in that first year or first couple years to get the most bang for your buck is absolutely critical. Um, because you could write up a huge elaborate plan. And I, I fell victim to this myself on my piece of property about trying to bite off more than I can chew with different projects and tweaks and different stuff I can add and subtract. Whereas now I've kind of stepped back into saying, okay, what's my highest priority? Got a lot of stuff going on, a lot of irons in the fire, um, different things I do with real estate consulting, the, uh, the nine to five job, going to have a kid here soon, all this stuff and being able to balance it, definitely got to prioritize um, what, I put my time into on my personal property um, is more important now than it probably ever has been because now my time is getting less and less available for, for me and my stuff. Um, and rightfully so, I think it's a great thing going forward. I'm, I'm blessed to be able to, you know, work with folks um, consulting wise and do the real estate things and help people find pieces of land and help people, you know, sell their property and get the most value for their parcel and stuff like that. Um, I, I think it's, it's a wonderful thing and I'm blessed to be able to do it and have the support and love of my wife to do it. Um, and now to be able to share that and have, you know, have a little one. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm through the roof, uh, uh, blessed and just thankful for that, you know, hundred percent. So, um, yeah, getting, getting a little, getting a little emotional tonight with it. Um, but anyway, uh, other than that, with the, uh, the other tasks of the day, um, met with a local farmer who leases uh, my grandmother's ground. Um, uh, just tidying up a couple things with the lease agreement for uh, the tillable going forward on that. Um, finalizing a couple of details, stuff like that. Um, got everything straightened out, a couple of the issues we had in the past. Addressed, fixed, all of the above. Um, got it going forward with it um, in the right direction. And uh, now I got to do more work for that farmer because of that, unrelated, but just um, was asked because we started talking about all the stuff I can do, all the other stuff that's um, uh, been brought up in the conversations we were having today with him about, you know, the maps and the different things that I can do and, you know, helping them balance and, you know, basically kind of consult on the, the mapping, the organizational kind of the management side of things. 
um, talking about all the different things that, you know, I could potentially help them with. So I got another meeting with that, um, that farm, I guess we'll call it, I would say individual, but it's a farm now. It's a whole family ordeal. So I got a whole meeting with them next week and, um, we'll, uh, flesh out the rest of the, uh, the goals and objectives, but, um, being able to put it out there and get the right crop going into the ground, um, for what folks want, what my grandmother wants and everything like that for the, the use of the land and taking care of the land in the right way, um, moving forward, I think is a huge piece of that. And, um, they've been very accommodating with that. There's been some humps and some struggles with that. I'm not going to say there hasn't been, but, uh, I think moving forward now, they're they're a great fit and a great uh, great tenant going forward with us. So, a couple comments rolled in. Aunt Lynn tuning in. Thank you, Aunt Lynn. Right in the fields. Yeah, just uh, everything's kind of coming to a head here really quick. Middle of uh, middle end of March is you know a little over a month away now. So, yeah, definitely right in the right in the fields tonight on the on everything and just had a lot of drive time today. And when you have a lot of drive time in a day, um you have a lot of time to think about stuff and it kind of all hits you for sure. Uh, Jerry says, what's your feeling as to why there seems to be such a rift between bow hunters and crossbow hunters? I don't see that in other States. Uh, that's a good comment, Jerry. And I did have that on my phone and I was going to dip into that. Um, but we can dip into it right now. I think it's a good, good segue comment. Uh, yeah. So I think um, it's definitely in other States. I think we see it more here in New York because we live in New York. Um, but I think it's it's huge in a lot of other states um, where a lot of these areas where um, it's increased the archery harvest as a whole. Um, I know if uh, Bo Hunt's uh, tuning in tonight, he must not be because I'm assuming he would have probably jumped right on this this comment right here. Um, he's, he's a very uh, vocal um, opposition of the crossbow versus vertical bow debate, I guess. Um, my feelings on it are, I think if it makes you, um, if it makes you more ethical in your harvestability, I think it is something that, and this is something that I think me and Nate have both agreed on numerous times and a lot of other folks that have been on, you know, with us and everything. If it makes you more effective and more, um, lethal and more able to get the job done in a more ethical and responsible way, I think it's a good fit. I don't necessarily see where it's a um, it's a cop out for being lazy or some people say they don't have enough time to do it. Um, I say no matter what weapon you're shooting, you should shoot it, um, you know, numerous times, shoot it throughout the season. You know, it shouldn't just be a go check it at the range. Boom, I'm done. Um, pull your weapon out, you know, even if it's not necessarily just um, the weapon you're using. I know, Jerry, we talked about a couple things um about kind of staying sharp or different topics that we you know you do a, a little blog that you do as well we talked about different things like having some having some trigger time whether it's at the range backyard with pop cans um doing a little small game hunting this time of the year especially with the mild winter we've had um putting some trigger time out there and just being proficient with a weapon um a long gun probably type weapon in the small game as instance, but you could, you could definitely throw on a few judo points and my buddy Derek out in Idaho, that was something that he carries in his quiver every time he goes to the woods because they have a, a fair to high grouse population on a lot of these hillsides. And while you're, you know, hunting along looking for, you know, deer elk or whatever you might be hunting up in the hills that day, it's very common to come on to some grouse and being able to get in range and uh, judo point one or two of them. So, Having those uh, those skill sets, shooting your bow throughout the season, um, I try to shoot it. I shoot my bow, and people will laugh at me for this. I shoot my bow before I go sit every sit, evening sit. Mornings I don't because I can't see my pins. Obviously, when I'm walking in, you know, before I walk into my stand. But evening sits, I carry a block target in the back of my truck and a practice broadhead. And every time before I go to the stand or make my walk in for the day where I park my truck, I put the, the target up 25, 30 yards, whatever it might be that day. I put the pin on it. I go through my whole setup. I squeeze it off and um, that just keeps me sharp with it. Um, so I think that dials back to everything, whether that's uh, bow, crossbow, gun, muzzle loader, handgun, all that stuff. You should, 
you should be able to shoot that weapon proficiently enough and have enough confidence in that weapon that it's going to perform. Um, I think the riff is um, a lot of folks might see like the crossbow bow debate being a, a shortcut or cheating, whatever. Um, if you treat it like a bow, like it should be, um, I, I have no doubt that they are deadly. They are definitely just as deadly. Um, I think they can be used and abused as can every weapon um, in, in certain situations. And I'm not saying that it can't do it. I'm just saying that maybe ethically shooting 40, 50, 60 yards with a crossbow, can the weapon do it? Absolutely. Can a vertical bow do it? It can do it. And just like a crossbow can, but the ethics sides of it, I think start getting a little blurred because they don't treat it as a archery piece of equipment. Um, in some cases, some cases I'm saying some, I'm not trying to throw everybody into a pigeonhole here with it, but I'm just kind of speaking in a very general term. I think it can be used and abused. And again, same thing, just because your rifle can shoot two, 300 yards. If you're not shooting two, 300 yards or further at a range, you have no business shooting your weapon that far at an animal. Um, like we were talking at leagues this uh, past Tuesday, yesterday, I was talking to a kid who is fairly new into hunting. He shoots leagues with us. And he was saying he's got no problem shooting 50 yards with his bow, 40 yards with his bow. And I asked him, I said, well, how many deer have you shot with your bow? You know, he's like, well, just like, I, I forget what he said. One or two, or maybe he said none. I can't even remember what he said, um, you know, in the conversations or whatnot. But he's like, oh, I shoot 40, 50 yards all the time with my bow. And I'm like, but when you're talking living, breathing animals, the ethics side and the, 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 um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm on a loss for word for the other side of the conversation. I want to go that the ethics side and the, um, the logistics side of it is it's a living, living, breathing target. You're not shooting paper. You're not shooting foam. Um, and do I shoot 40, 50 yards during season? Yes. I'd like to shoot that far when I'm practicing. Um, but case in point, um, I've missed them right dead close. I've had them right in what I like to be my wheelhouse at 20, 30 yards and they just don't take the right trail or the right situation. And, um, you know, they drop on the shot, whatever it might be, all that stuff can kind of come into play when you're dealing with a living, breathing target, um, that you just don't get with paper and foam, let alone the adrenaline kick that 99% of us get when we're when the, we're in the situation um all that comes into play and should be factored into to your decision making when you decide to make a shot or when to shoot when to draw all that stuff when to raise your weapon and then your backstop beyond all that it's all a big process um and that stuff needs to be needs to be rehearsed and practiced to be proficient with it and ethical with it uh Jerry says, I know I don't have the shoulders I had when I was your age. Your mom and aunt know why. I just can't draw any compound anymore. And that's that's an entirely fair argument. I'm I'm like I said, I'm not anti-crossbow by any means, you know, whatsoever. Um I just think that they need to be treated like archery equipment, like they are. Um, and some of these companies that again, I get it, it's marketing, it's trying to sell a product, you shoot it out of a um out of a vice, you can shoot it 100 yards with the right scope, the right setup, everything like that. You can put quarter size groups at 100 yards with this crossbow. It shoots, you know, 10,000 feet a second. Obviously, that's an exaggeration, um, but 10,000 feet a second or whatever. And it's it's the best thing since slight, sliced bread. Yeah, if you put a vertical bow through a, a hooter shooter or whatever you call them, um, that puts everything at the right stop angle, everything like that, basically is like a, a lead sled or whatever you want to call it for your bow where it pulls it back full draw shoots it with perfect everything setup release all that stuff archery equipment can shoot 100 yards is it ethical i don't believe so is there are there some people that do it in different different game different um habitats and scenario obviously it comes into play with that um, but the people that have the um, more of the ability or 
the skill set to shoot that far are unbelievable shots. I still think that they are a different breed of people that can shoot 50 yards um, efficiently, effectively, um, and do that. And a lot of these people that are shooting some of these far shots with archery equipment are in more western states, um, not as much here in the east. Um, so I think that has a big thing to do with it, um, of that that riff, and that's kind of been this whole you know, a little rabbit hole of conversation of Jerry's um, diving into the crossbow thing. Um, again, usually it gets brought up once or twice a show just because Bo's got to throw the comment in on it. Um, and we appreciate it. It gives, you know, good context and different folks tuning in, different episodes, um, everything like that. So, but yeah, I definitely get the argument with it. Um, you know, my dad primarily now hunts with a, with a crossbow versus a vertical bow, um, you know, because of, you know, different physical abilities, everything like that. But again, um, case in point, you know, we'll, we'll dive back to the story of it. He had a couple years ago, two years ago, sorry. Um, he had the opportunity to shoot a uh, double wide. The buck he ended up killing with his rifle. He had the opportunity to shoot that deer at probably 40 or 42 yards. I forget exactly what he said he ranged him at. Um, but he had double wide come through and um, he just said, hey, he's like, this deer is out of my effective range for archery equipment. I can't shoot this deer, you know, and whereas, you know, some folks might have said, well, I shoot, I can shoot my crossbow 100 yards. I can shoot 40 yards. Boom. And, you know, trying to figure out what a what a bolt does, let alone an arrow or whatever it does um, and the things it can do, it can hit uh, a I say a blade of grass, that's kind of an extreme example, but it could hit a goldenrod sapling stick, twig in between you and your target um, and totally deflect. Um, so I think there's just a lot of different uh, factors that could come in with archery equipment versus, um, you know, firearms that uh, just need to be taken into consideration with the, the bow and crossbow thing. Jerry says, totally agree. Yeah, I'm not pro and I'm not anti um, but I think when used in the right applications, I think that, um, I think they're a good fit for, for individuals in some instances. So thank you, Jerry. Appreciate the comment. And I'm um, sorry I didn't get to it sooner. Um, but it was on my docket here. I saw you sent the message in, so I apologize for not getting to it sooner, but thank you. Uh, Tom says, I have seen some videos of people hunting and shooting at these higher yardage. It is crazy, but they are lethal. I think both seasons should have either cross or vertical. Again, I can see, I can see both sides of the debate with it. Um, I think too, that, um, if you, if you are using a crossbow, I think you should have to take a bow hunter safety course in New York. Um, I am a firm believer in that, that you should have an archery um, sided education to your to your thing and not just say that you watch the video online and that you can use it because you watch this video and you sign a little slip in the book. Um, last I knew that was how you, you know, were able to use a crossbow and use it under a muzzleloader stamp. Um, and uh, I think that New York State's kind of struggling where... Um, they're trying to fit where a crossbow fits into the whole situation. And I understand um, the why side of it with the muzzleloader permit. Um, but I still think to hunt during archery season where we are in the Southern zone, I think you still should have the archery permission to be able to use a crossbow with a muzzleloader tag, if that makes sense. Um, or have a separate stamp that you have to buy. That's a crossbow stamp um, or something like that, if you're going to use that weapon and then be obviously, you know, trained into how to properly utilize it. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to that work on bows, um, specifically at like heritage outdoor sports, where they say these people have no idea how to assemble, shoot, you know, use these weapons. Um, you know, they just don't put the time in with that weapon to get familiar with it. I can't tell you how many blown up bows I saw in the back of, of the bow shop this year at heritage because people are just um either not reading you know how to use this weapon versus other you know models or whatever might be of that weapon um but i think that the the crossbow side of thing as a whole i can't say as a whole um 
pretty close to a 50 50 split on the crossbow side of things um gets abused I, i'll just i'll just say that in a lot of cases i think um in some way shape or form um it it, it can be abused i think that's not a majority necessarily but it's i would say a fair 50 50 split i think um can be can be abused um and just because of misconceptions about the product um i think is as is, is the reasoning for that um kind of abuse or whatever abuse i guess isn't the right word but kind of the the misuse i guess is just due to a um a lack of knowledge or a lack of understanding about the weapon that you're using um it was the same thing when i was talking about uh uh, trying to take a deer with my pistol for the first time and having deer, numerous deer um, opportunities before I ended up taking my first, um, this doe actually, the one that sits on top of my lamp and kind of provides a, a different kind of light here in the office. Um, that just kind of sits on top of my lamp as a, as a top lampshade. Um, that first doe that I harvested with my pistol, um, I passed five six i think different deer um a dose actually not just i passed i think three three bucks with the pistol um just because they weren't um up to the the age class that we were trying to target on that property but i had does come through that i didn't feel comfortable with the angle um i wanted nice broadside you know maybe slightly quartering away shot with that handgun um being able to have a good solid steady rest off of either a shooting rail or an adjacent tree in that stand um, or someplace I could really lock up and get, you know, down on that weapon and feel comfortable with the shot. And I was drawn down on a couple of those um, before I ended up taking that one. Um, and uh, textbook shot, it was actually a really cool story. The other thing that's right behind that is the picture from when um, <coughs> it's actually a cool one the picture of that night when i shot my first pistol doe um and liza's doe looks a lot smaller but her doe was actually bigger uh, i believe it was like three or four pounds bigger this was december 5th 2021 on the back of the picture um we were at cider ridge uh i believe liza shot hers first and then was calling me and um then i a couple minutes later here came a couple does down the trail and boom i got an opportunity one that night too so um, again, knowing your weapon and being comfortable and proficient with it, I think is, um, is the biggest thing with, with your choice of weapon. Uh, I didn't realize that you didn't need a bow safety course for a crossbow. Yeah, that's a misconception. I mean, you just have to take, I believe last I knew it was a little snippet safety video and anybody tuning in that, um, again, that was the last time I did the little certificate thing for the crossbow. When I shot, I shot a, um, I shot two deer with the crossbow, um, two does with the crossbow in previous seasons. Um, and the reason I decided to do that was just happened to be super cold. Um, I didn't want to take uh, take my bow out and risk uh, uh, not being able to pull it back. I needed to get some doe harvest done in the late archery uh, muzzleloader season. I didn't have a muzzleloader at the time, so the crossbow was my weapon of choice to take out and um, shot two does with the crossbow um different sets but shot two does with the crossbow um but yeah all you needed to do was take this little it was a video link that was on the dec website at the time and then you signed a little square that was in the uh, regulations book and that said that yeah i watched the video and you know i i know what to do because i watched this safety video and we're good to go um and yeah and it's under the muzzleloader stamp so if you're hunting with a crossbow you have to do it with a muzzleloader stamp um not a bow license so again read your regulations book um some folks that don't hunt with crossbows might not know that but that's definitely something that um should be uh should be taken into uh, account when you're um obviously taking a weapon afield is know what the legal regulations are for that making sure that you're the right in new york state the right width the right draw weight the right you know everything like that i haven't been too familiar with the crossbow side of stuff because i just don't hunt with them um and that excalibur that my dad used or my dad has rather um has always been uh been up to new york legal standards right up since it was um you know started to be accepted as a as a 
acceptable weapon to hunt with. So, again, as long as it's legal, ethical, safe, you know, I don't have a problem with it. Um, it's just when it's not treated like the appropriate weapon is where um, I think it it gets into a gray area with uh, with my my position on it. So, all right, well, nice right at that one hour mark. Um, I'm assuming my wife will be home soon if she's not home already. Um, sometimes her classes that she teaches there at Hobart go a little bit late in the evening. Um, on Wednesdays, depending on what she's got going on or if she's got another meeting or something like that. And leading up to the sip and stroll, she's had other late meetings. So um, I'm going to get upstairs and see my wife if she's home. And if not, wait for her to get home so I can wish her happy Valentine's Day yet again um, and uh, spend some time with her before I got to hit the hay tonight. But yeah, great day, long, busy day. A lot of stuff accomplished and was able to still get down here and shoot up a podcast episode for you guys. So, oh, thank you, Mom. Sorry. Not Excalibur, 10-point crossbow. Good, good point. Good catch. Sorry. My bad. I remember he was between the 10-point and the Excalibur. I think that's why it crossed in my head on, crossed a couple wires on it. So, thanks, Mom, for the correction, and thanks for tuning in all the way through this. Appreciate it. So, again, we'll be posting um, – We'll be putting a post up about the embroidered uh, knit hats. They're going to be the beanie style hat um, with no fold over knit hat style. We're talking just a straight, you know, kind of a, a skull cap beanie or whatever you want to call them. I'm um, embroidered up with that hundred proof logo. And I think they did a real good job with it. So we're just finalizing um, the pricing and stuff like that. And that's how it comes out on the embroidery machine. So really, really cool. Um, something we've been waiting on. I know the embroidery machine has been down from the lady that we reached out to the local small business that we reached out to for that. So yeah, we got a lot of other stuff coming up and then the sip and stroll this Saturday, hope to catch you guys there in Phelps. Um, and then a lot of other cool stuff coming forward. Uh, we got to do some follow-up videos and some in the field videos, um, going forward to give you guys more of what you want. So if you want to see anything specifically featured, I know frost seeding, and hinge cutting have been some things that have been top pro top priority questions for a lot of folks. Um, hopefully get out there and get a couple of them shot up and or posted some uh, some tips and tricks and stuff like that and some posts from other folks um, to be able to help you guys out. So thank you guys for tuning in. If you haven't, um, please head over to the YouTube page, hit the subscribe button and the little bell notification. So you get notified whenever we do any of these uh, live streams, episode, podcasts, anything like that. We are available on Apple Podcasts, um, Spotify, and any of the major podcast platforms. And if we're not where you listen to your podcasts, let us know and we'll get um, the stream linked up over there as well. So thank you guys very much for listening to Hunter Proof. Uh, we're going to try to do one of these live episodes from the tasting on Saturday. We'll see how it works. I don't know how the internet service is going to be in that location. We're going to try it, but no promises with it. Um, and if not, we'll be doing our Fresh Crack Friday video um, that gets posted every Friday at noon for the whiskey kind of side of stuff. And then, um, yeah, all the other content in between. And thank you guys so much for the support. It means the world. And uh, hopefully Nate's back next week. He'll definitely be there at the Sip and Stroll this weekend. We'll catch you all next time here on the show, whether we're in the office, at the bar, in the deer shed, or taking the show on the road for um, an episode. Um, I think we had whiskey road trips or something like that got thrown out at my wife's baby shower this weekend. So stay tuned for more episode, guys. We appreciate the support and have a good night and happy Valentine's to everybody. Cheers. <laughs>